Okay. Hopefully everybody can um, can hear me okay. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Again, uh, welcome to the Monty Hart uh, lecture series. Um, this afternoon, the topic of discussion is peripheral vascular disease, and it is my pleasure to introduce our very own Dr. Jose Wiley, the Distinguished Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine, Director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory of the Montefiore Medical Center here at Moses Division, and the Director of Endovascular Interventions. Now, Dr. Wiley is a leader in the field of peripheral arterial disease. He holds multiple board certifications, subspecialties of endovascular medicine and interventional cardiology. He's also a distinguished fellow of the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention. Dr. Wiley's contributions to the field are widely recognized, having published in numerous peer-reviewed journals, co-authoring book chapters, serving serving as chief editor for leading books in the field. It comes as no surprise, Dr. Wiley has participated in numerous national and international conferences as a guest speaker. Over the years, he's been widely recognized, but none most more important than the Distinguished Congressional Ellis Island Medal of Honor, one of the highest civilian awards given to those who contribute to our nation's academic achievements. It is with great pleasure and much enthusiasm that I introduce a dear friend and mentor, Dr. Jose Wiley, who again will <coughs> talking to us about a very important topic that is largely underdiagnosed, but carries significant morbidity, the who, why, and how of peripheral artery disease. Dr. Wiley. Thank you, Nelson, for your kind uh, introduction. So I have an ambitious uh, list of learning objectives. Uh, we start with uh, exposing several misconceptions regarding peripheral disease, as epidemiology, screening, non-invasive evaluation, guideline-directed medical therapy, indications for revascularization. Finally, we will engage the current guidelines to optimize patient care and show a few cases. Now, there are many misconceptions around peripheral disease, um, and I'll try to address some of them. The first one is that peripheral disease must not be common or else we would hear more about it. But the truth of the matter is that we only see the tip of the iceberg. Peripheral disease is underappreciated and public awareness is limited. It is an age-dependent process, and the older the population, the higher the prevalence. Close to 20% of the population over 70 years of age has peripheral arterial disease. The risk of cardiovascular disease is increased by six folds. It is estimated that as many as 20 million individuals in the United States are affected by some form of peripheral vascular disease. That includes about 12 million with peripheral arterial disease and the rest with venous or lymphatic disease. In 7,013 patients with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease whose mean age was 69 and who participated in the reduction of atherothrombosis for continued health registry or the REACH study, the prevalence of concomitant symptomatic carotid disease, cerebrovascular disease, or both was up to 63%. Almost 40% had both coronary and peripheral arterial disease. 9.5 had both cerebral vascular and peripheral disease. 14% had peripheral, coronary, and cerebral vascular disease combined. And almost 37% had only peripheral arterial disease. As a result, the study concluded that patients with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease have a high prevalence of coexisting disease in other vascular beds, as you see in this slide. Now, there are specific ethnic prevalences in the United States, being African-American and American Indian, the groups with higher prevalence. Important risk factors for peripheral arterial disease, according to the Transatlantic Intersociety Consensus Working Group, include smoking and diabetes, and to a lesser extent, hypertension, 
hyperlipidemia, homocysteinemia, or elevated levels of C-reactive protein. The second misconception is that peripheral arterial disease is a disease of old people. I did show you that peripheral arterial disease is an age-dependent process, but precursors of atherosclerosis begin at an early age, and early detection and prevention avoids further complications. The third misconception is that peripheral arterial disease is a nuisance, and it will not kill you. Well, the REACH registry examine, as I mentioned before, symptomatic patients with coronary cerebrovascular and peripheral arterial disease for major adverse cardiac events, MACE. After one year of observation, patients with peripheral arterial disease experienced the highest rate of cardiovascular death when compared to patients with established coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disease. In fact, 50% of patients with peripheral tube disease die from coronary artery disease. Failure to aerobically exercise increases the risk for premature cardiovascular death. And I will show you some data to this regard. The fourth misconception is that there is no reason to search for peripheral tube disease. We look for it because peripheral arterial disease is debilitating, and failure to recognize this disease process underestimates that patients with peripheral arterial disease have greater cardiovascular mortality, as I had just told you, than those with coronary or cerebrovascular disease. The fifth misconception is that peripheral arterial disease is too expensive or hard to screen. All we need to obtain is a simple history and physical and an ankle brachial index that requires a blood pressure cuff and a handheld continuous wave Doppler, nothing else. These are the current American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association guidelines for measuring ankle brachial index and establishing the diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. That is 65 years or older, 50 years and older with risk factors for atherosclerosis, such as smoking and diabetes, or family history of PAD. Also, it includes younger than 50 years of age with diabetes and one other risk factor for atherosclerosis. Now, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommends against ABI as a screening tool for peripheral arterial disease and they state that it's because of insufficient evidence. I believe that this is based on the aspirin for asymptomatic atherosclerosis trial that failed to show a benefit of the use of aspirin in patients that had an ABI less than 0.9. However, to credit to the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, both partner study and the MESA study showed that low ABIs were associated with increased cardiovascular risk. The sixth misconception is that it doesn't matter if you discover early PAD, you can't do anything about it. And that's not true. Risk factor modification, exercise, drug therapy, and revascularization actually work. And I'll show you. Smoking cessation, statin therapy, Antihypertensive therapy with a therapeutic goal of less than 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Diabetes management to achieve a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%. Aspirin and or clopidogrel and supervised exercise have at least a 2A indication. Let's look specifically at exercise training. This bar graph shows the results of a meta-analysis of 21 studies that assess the benefit of exercise training in patients with intermittent claudication. In subjects who followed a program of exercise, the mean distance to onset of claudication pain increased 179%, and the distance to maximum claudication pain increased 
compared with dysentus for controls. The greatest improvement were found in exercise programs whose sessions lasted more than 30 minutes, that incorporated at least three sessions per week, that used near maximal pain during training as a pain endpoint, and that lasted longer than six months. Now, as shown in this table, a meta-analysis of the magnitude of the functional improvement that resulted from therapy studies for intermittent claudication, whose duration range from 90 to 180 days show that supervised exercise resulted in the greatest benefit, followed next by celostazole and then by pentoxifiline. Now, clever is the courage for peripheral arterial disease. This study randomized patients with peripheral arterial disease to optimal medical care, to supervised exercise, to stenting, and to supervised exercise plus stenting. And it showed that the best buy for the buck was supervised exercise therapy, followed by percutaneous interventions with stents, and lastly, medical management. Now, as shown in this figure, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial evaluated the relative efficacy of celostazole taken 100 milligrams twice a day compared with that of uh, pentoxifline, 400 milligrams three times a day in increasing maximal walking distance during treadmill testing in a group of almost 700 patients from 54 U.S. outpatient clinics. It was a big study. Maximal walking distance was measured at baseline and every four weeks for 24 weeks. Mean maximal walking distance in the 227 celostosol treated patients was significantly greater at every post-baseline visit compared with that of 232 patients who received pentoxifiline or that of the 239 patients who received placebo. Now, after 24 weeks, the mean maximum walking distance increased 54% in the celosazole treated group, 30% in the pentoxifiline treated group. Now, the increase in mean maximum walking distance in the pentoxifiline treated group was no different than that of the placebo group, which was 34%. Thus, the, the study concluded that celostazole was significantly better than uh, pentoxifiline or placebo in increasing walking distance. Now, Armstrong and colleagues showed that adherence to guideline-based medical therapy reduces major adverse cardiac events and major adverse limb events. They also showed that dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with peripheral arterial disease reduces mortality. Now, vorapaxor, which is a thrombin inhibitor, and ticagrelor, which we know is a P2Y12 antagonist, also reduce acute limb ischemia and the need for revascularization in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Statins also reduce major abyss cardiac and cerebrovascular events, mortality, amputations, and improve long-term patency in patients who undergo any sort of uh, revascularization. Now, this table summarizes the recommendations for improving outcomes and quality of life in patients with peripheral arterial disease, as we have been discussing up to now. The seventh misconception is that it isn't important to identify patients at risk for peripheral arterial disease or cardiovascular disease because everybody should reduce their cardiovascular risk as much as possible. And this is partly true, but we must also identify the subset of patients with subclinical disease who are at risk for progression. Almost every study has shown that if risk factors are present, the prevalence of peripheral arterial disease may reach up to one-third of the population. Okay, now let's talk of 
non-invasive evaluation of peripheral arterial disease. This flow chart is a good way to start this discussion. We first start with a history and physical. If it doesn't suggest peripheral arterial disease, you must look for an alternative diagnosis. If on the contrary, it is suggestive of peripheral arterial disease, the next step is to perform an ankle brachial index or an ABI. If it is less than 0.9, you have a diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. And the next step is to perform an anatomic assessment of disease to determine the location and severity of the, uh, of the disease process. If greater than 0.9, but the likelihood of peripheral arterial disease is high, then we send the patient to the vascular lab for a physiologic assessment. If greater than 1.4, it's a non-compressible vessel. And we likely should do a toe brachial, toe brachial index or a physiological assessment. Now, the ABI is the ratio of the highest ankle systolic pressure, either dorsalis pius or posterior tibialis, and the highest brachial systolic pressure. Now, note that systolic blood pressure in the ankle should be higher than in the arms. And this is because it relies on the concept of retrograde wave reflection from resistant distal arterioles, which is additive to the anti-grade wave. You can also appreciate the interpretation of normal and abnormal values in, in this slide. Now let's look at this ABI. In this case, the right ankle brachial index is within normal limits and the left is non-diagnostic because vessels are non-compressible. Now, even though an ABI is a great test, it doesn't answer everything. In this one, the right ankle brachial index is normal, and the one in the left is non-diagnostic because of non-compressibility as well. Now, the next step is to perform a toe brachial index because digital ve uh, vessels do not become calcified. And values less than 0 0.7 diagnose peripheral arterial disease. Okay, an exercise ankle brachial index is used when a patient with high pretest probability of peripheral arterial disease has a normal ankle brachial index. Frequently, this is seen in patients with the iliac disease because those patients have very large collaterals coming from the internal iliac. Now, exercise ABI protocols consist of exercising a patient on a treadmill for five minutes at two miles per hour and 12 degree inclination. A decrease of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury in ankle pressure or a post-exercise ABI decrease of greater than 20% suggests a hemodynamically significant peripheral arterial disease. We can also employ segmental pressures to the standard ankle brachial index in order to localize hemodynamically significant lesions. We apply blood pressure cuffs in the ankle, the calf, the low thigh, and high thigh. We also use a continuous wave Doppler signal at the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibialis and obtain segmental pressures in the following order. This is important. Ankle pressures first, followed by calf pressures, low thigh pressures, and finally, high thigh pressures. We also obtain bilateral arm pressures. Remember, as we discussed before, that lower extremity pressures should be higher than the reference arm pressures. In fact, they should be greater than 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, a pressure drop between adjacent levels in the lower extremities of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury is considered abnormal. Now, 
like any study, there's limitations. Patients with calcified arteries make it very difficult, as we discussed before. Moderate resting peripheral arterial disease with unremarkable exam make it difficult as well. We may rely on other testing, such as exercise ABI, as we discussed before. We cannot determine stenosis versus occlusion. Sequential lesions are difficult to distinguish, and severe inflow disease makes infrainguinal lesions difficult to identify. Okay, let's talk of uh, pulse volume recording, or PVR. PVR uses plethysmography, which measures changes in blood volume. It's not velocity of red blood cells, it's changes in blood volume. It does it by using blood pressure cuffs and sensors. Right. Now, a normal pulse volume recording, or PVR, appears similar to an intraarterial pressure waveform. It has a narrow complex with a rapid upstroke and a rapid downstroke with a dichrotic notch. And peripheral arterial disease is characterized by a decrease in the amplitude of the waveform, a loss of the dichrotic notch in a widened waveform. In this slide, you see different PVR patterns corresponding to different degrees of disease. Okay. Now, this is a normal pulse volume recording. You have a narrow complex with a rapid upstroke, rapid downstroke with a dichrotic notch. Okay. Let's look at uh, one, uh, one case. This is a uh, 59-year-old male, four years of right buttocks aching, only with walking, relieved by stopping or standing. No rest pain, ulcers, or gangrene. 50 pack year history of tobacco use, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and palpable pulses in the right femoral, popliteal, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibialis. And this is their it's, uh, ABIs with uh, segmental pressures. Now, what stands out in this ABI with segmental pressures and PVR is that there is no systolic pressure augmentation at the level of the high thighs, particularly in the right leg. As I told you, it should be at least an augmentation of 30 millimeters of mercury, and you don't see that here. Now, B mode is brightness mode and employs high frequency interrogation, and Doppler is uh, low frequencies overimposed on brightness modes and quantifies red blood cell velocities. Now, the top tracing is a normal Doppler tracing, but the bottom one shows spectral broadening, which is this uh, snowstorm under the, uh, the waveforms, and low velocity is suggestive of diffuse disease. And as you may expect, this patient had right common iliac severe stenosis. Now, when you use Doppler, remember that it is very operator dependent. Make sure your Doppler angle is at 60 degrees as best as you can. Pay attention to waveforms, Doppler velocities, color Doppler, and waveforms. As we discussed, Doppler measures velocities of red blood cells under the uh, ultrasound probe. And here are some of the different waveforms that we can obtain. A normal pattern is a triphasic one. And then in a very abnormal one, it's a monophasic waveform. Remember that stenosis is characterized by high-velocity Doppler signals with spectral broadening. And a post stenotic signal is characterized by a dampened, low-velocity signal with spectral broadening. And here are duplex criteria for determining range of degree of stenosis. If you have less than 50% stenosis, the stenotic to Pre-stenotic peak systolic velocity ratio is less than 2 to 1 and have a triphasic waveform with peak systolic velocities of less than 200 centimeters per second. If it's between 50 and 74 percent, the stenotic to pre-stenotic peak systolic velocity ratio 
should be around 2 to 1, with a monophasic waveform and a peak systolic velocity between 200 and 400 centimeters per second. If it's greater than 75%, the stenotic to pre-stenotic peak systolic velocity ratio is 4 to 1, with monophasic waveforms and peak systolic velocities greater than 400 centimeters per second. If the segment is occluded, you're not going to have any, uh, any uh, velocity tracing, and you're going to probably going to find only a pre-occlusive thump because there's no flow. Now, let's look um, at two more cases. This first case is an 80-year-old male with bilateral calf pain. So you see, the ABS are very abnormal. On the right is 0 0.4, and on the left is 0 0.3. This high thigh pressure, the high thigh pressures are lower than expected. So I told you they should be 30 millimeters of mercury higher than arm pressures. There's abnormal pulse volume recording, or PVR. It's worse in the left than in the right, with a flat line in the left pedal vessels. Slightly low Doppler velocity with biphasic waveforms and some spectral broadening in the right common femoral artery, with non-homogeneous color Doppler flow in the uh, right uh, superficial femoral artery. There's no flow in the distal SFA. And very low velocities with monophasic waveforms, as well as abundant uh, spectral broadening in the right uh, perineal artery. On the left, the left common femoral artery uh, has normal Doppler velocities with a triphasic waveform. There's low Doppler velocity signals with biphasic waveforms and spectral broadening in the left proximal superficial femoral artery. No Doppler signal in the left distal superficial femoral artery. And no flow in the left posterior tibialis artery. So you would conclude that this patient has bilateral iliac disease with occluded right superficial femoral artery and popliteal artery, as well as occlusions of the left superficial femoral artery, popliteal, and infrapopliteal vessel. Look at this case. This is a 76-year-old male, status post right as a face stent, severe right lower extremity claudication with walking one block. As you see, this high thigh velocities, the high uh, thigh systolic pressures are lower than expected, left uh, worse than the right, but blunted pulse volume recording or PVR with loss of decrotic notch in the right lower extremity. Baseline ABIs are normal, 1.07 on the right, 1.3 on the left, but post-exercise ABI is abnormal in the right leg there is greater than 30 millimeters of mercury systolic pressure drop in the right ankle or greater than 20% decrease in ABI. That is abnormal. And you see that the right ankle pulse volume recording is very abnormal. It's almost a flat line. Right coming from our artery Doppler signals are normal as well as this waveform and Doppler. The mid right superficial femoral artery has low velocities and biphasic waveforms with good color flow. We clearly see a stent. And we see low Doppler velocity signals and almost monophasic waveforms at the uh, prox uh, proximal to the mid superficial femoral artery stent. and also poor color flow at the distal edge of the right superficial femoral artery stent. Distal to the stent, there's high velocity Doppler signals with spectral broadening. The diagnosis is right superficial femoral artery instant restenosis.
Now, is this enough? And the answer is no. The non-invasive laboratory identifies physiologically significant disease, but lacks the anatomic detail to plan for intervention, if that is the case. Digital subtraction and geography is the gold standard for anatomic imaging, but MRA and CTA are just as good. In this slide, you can appreciate that digital subtraction and geography on the left provides the same amount of detail as the MRA on the right. And you can appreciate on this MRA all the detail that we need in order to plan an, interve an intervention. Now, there's limitations in MRA as well. Mental prosthesis, older pacemakers and ICDs that may not be compatible, and poor visualization when calcium is present. CTA also provides almost the same detailed accuracy as DSA, digital subtraction and geography, and MRA, but uses iodinated uh, contrast and x-rays. Notice that CTA also provides the necessary detail to plan an intervention. And also obtain 3D model that evaluates the vasculature in any projection and from any angle in order to evaluate the presence of stenosis or aneurysms. The major limitation of CT or CTA include large iodine contrast load, thus limiting its use in uh, uh, patients with renal insufficiency. It is not very accurate in visualizing pedal vessels in particular, and dense calcium can give a false diagnosis of patency. Finally, we get to endovascular management of peripheral arterial disease. Since 2005, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines recommend endovascular revascularization in patients with lifestyle limiting claudication who have failed guideline medical therapy and supervised exercise, as long as there is a favorable risk benefit ratio. The 2016 revised guidelines gave a 1A recommendation for endovascular treatment of aorta occlusive disease in patients that also have lifestyle limiting claudication. It gave a 2A recommendation for endovascular revascularization in patients with uh, femoral popliteal disease presenting with uh, lifestyle limiting claudication And it gave a 2B recommendation for endovascular treatment of infrapopliteal disease in patients presenting with claudication. Now, bear in mind that the infrapopliteal vessels are conduits to the foot. The main blood supply to the calf muscles arises from the sural branches of the popliteal artery. And the risk of a claudicant to become a critical limb ischemia patient is only 10%. 25% of patients with critical limb ischemia will have an amputation, and 25% of them will die within one year. So really, the true indication to intervene in the infrapopliteal vessels is critical limb ischemia, which we define as resting pain, ulcer, or gangrene. Anything else, you probably do more bad or worse than good. And finally, there is no indication for an endovascular procedure for the sole purpose of preventing critical limb ischemia. So totally only 10% of claudicans will develop critical limb ischemia. Also remember that intervening on a claudicant with infrapopliteal disease increases the risk of critical limb ischemia by several folds. So you make things worse. 
Okay. I would now like to show a few cases of uh, what we do in the, in the endovascular suite. We not only do non-invasive testing, but we also intervene in, uh, in a revascularized patient with uh, peripheral tube disease. I want to show you two cases. Now, this is a 65-year-old male presenting with uh, right buttocks and thigh pain when walking less than 200 meters. As you see, there is an occluded right common iliac, which reconstitutes at the level of the external iliac. So what we did, we gained access in the contralateral common femoral artery, that is the left common femoral artery. We then wired the right common iliac and snared it through an axis that we had obtained in the right common femoral artery. Then we proceeded to dilate the uh, iliac occlusion, and finally, we implanted a very large self-expanding stent, which we then post-dilated. And this is the final result. Of course, symptoms immediately resolved. And the last case I want to show you is this of a 75-year-old active male patient with history of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, on adequate optimal medical management who presented with uh, lifestyle limiting severe claudication occurring at less than half a block. He had failed supervised exercise therapy and celostazole. And as you see in this uh, cine loops, The right common femoral artery is okay, the profundus is okay, but the superficial femoral artery is completely occluded, and it reconstitutes at the level of the popliteal artery via profunda collaterals because the superficial femoral artery is completely occluded. We only have single vessel runoff via the anterior tibialis to the dorsalis pedis. That's all we got. So I'll show you how we tackle this, this, uh, this patient. So we tried crossing this lesion antegrade, but ended up having our wire in the submintimal space. We never recanalized the lumen. We then got access from the right dorsalis pedis and advanced retrograde our wire. Now we have both wires, an anterograde wire and a retrograde wire that happen to be in subintimal spaces. They never met. So we proceeded to employ what is called a cart technique in which we inflated a balloon via the uh, retrograde subintimal space and then fenestrated it with a wire that was coming antegrade and we created a new space or a new lumen. We then proceeded to dilate that newly created space and created a new lumen. And here we're dilating the juncture of the true lumen with the subintimal space that we had already created into a true lumen. We then proceeded to dilate, integrate with uh, drug-coated balloons, the entire newly created lumen. And I'll show you the, uh, the final picture. Remember that in the first picture, we only had a profunda femoris. The superficial femoral artery was occluded. And this is the final result. Now you have a profunda and a superficial femoral artery that goes to the popliteal, and it gives flow to a single vessel runoff to the ankle via the anterior tibialis and dorsalis pedis. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Jose, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, the truth is that um, I remember uh, almost 20 years ago when uh, I was a junior faculty at uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, 
Eric Topol, um, almost um, patting us in the back uh, uh, with, a, with, with a stick uh, because we were not paying much attention to peripheral arterial disease. And um, we had a big push uh, at the time um, for a screening. Uh, you made a good point about uh, the uh, prevalence of calcified disease in the elderly and, and the false positive results that we can get with ABI. Do you consider in any circumstances that when we're sending a patient uh, for screening directly at uh, PBRs uh, or um, uh, Doppler studies um, as a first uh, test? Um, yes. So what I've uh, been doing in my, my practice is that a, a ankle brachial index is coupled with a pulse volume recording. But even with, with a, uh, a normal ABI with a normal pulse volume recording, if you have iliac disease, you may miss some disease. So even if it's normal and you pretest po- probability is very high, you're convinced that this patient truly has intermittent claudication then we should exercise them. And as I said, any, uh, any drop in, a, um, in an ankle pre- pre- pressure or, or, or exercise ABI of less than 0.7 is diagnostic of peripheral arterial disease. We don't use the 0.9 cutoff, we go down to 0.7. Sure. Okay, thank you. Nelson, do you have any questions? Yeah, Dr. Wiley, that was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, let's review a couple of questions. Then I have a couple of uh, my own, but um, interesting uh, a question is um, um, maybe some of our referrals have noticed that after you perform a endovascular intervention, now the question becomes, how do you treat these patients after the procedure, it seems like you go ahead and you open these chronic occlusions, these long occlusions, sometimes you use balloons, sometimes you use stents, um, but typically the majority of them end up going home with aspirin and Plavix uh, for a limited amount of time, say about 30 days. But um, I'm sure you've probably heard of some of the recent trials, the Voyager PD trial, which showed some benefit of use of rivaroxaban for 30 days, whether you use Plavix or not, in conjunction to the aspirin. There's a little bit of bleeding risk, certainly, but just wondering what, the, what, what your practice was as far as using you know, dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin, Plavix for a limited of time. Do you go ahead and use um, rivaroxaban depending on the bleeding risk? Um, you know, what's your practice? Yeah, so the the great majority of uh, of uh, our patients, we uh, we place them on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for at least one one month. As you you know, the data is not as robust as we would like it to be in peripheral to disease after a uh, intervention. Um, most of the data that uh, we use, we've essentially copied from the coronary uh, uh, data, and uh, that data had come uh, when we were using non-drug-coded uh, technology. Um, but now, as uh, you may be aware, um, we not only use uh, non-drug-coded uh, technology, but we now use drug-coded technology as well in balloons and in stents. So the question whether they should be on uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for a longer period of time is not very well um, decided as of yet. Yeah, no, that's a, that, that's a very true, the, kind of a very important distinction. It seems like when they went ahead and added a rivaroxaban in that study, it seemed like, a, you know, there was a less acute limb uh, events after the intervention. Correct. But um, I think overall, I think a safe thing to do is a kind of sticking with aspirin plaques. And again, kind of the data is not really out there and it's not too robust. There was a second question. It was, uh, it was about... Um, and just a technique of uh, when it is that we use drug-coated balloons versus stents when we're opening these long occlusions. It's important to understand, at least uh, for for the uh, our audiences, you know, these are areas with very high flexion points. We, you know, you know we're, we're talking about the femoral artery, you know, the, the superficial femoral artery, the, the popliteal artery. These are these are arteries that bend and twist a million different ways. And so the question becomes, well, 
when when do you consider just ballooning, uh, you know, opening these occlusions at, versus placing a stent, which is probably a more rigid structure there? Is, it, is there um, an algorithm that you more or less follow? Yeah. Um, now with the advent of uh, drug-coated uh, balloons, and there's some limitations and controversies with them, them as, uh, as you're aware, um, stents are primarily limited now to hemodynamically significant dissections. If you don't have a uh, significant di dissection, then leaving metal behind is probably not your best option. Drug-coated uh, balloons have uh, very good uh, uh, decrease in uh, restenosis, uh, very comparable to that of stent without having to let uh, metal behind. Um, the the question of um, stenting and uh, flexion points is, is ve very true, even though there's uh, other technologies such as interwoven stents that have been used in uh, flexion points such as the popliteal artery, referring to the supera stent. But for the most part, uh, if you don't have a, uh, a hemodynamically significant uh, dissection, leaving metal behind is probably not in the best interest of your patient. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, it's uh, completely agree. Now, um, just um, maybe going a little bit deeper into the you know the drug coated balloons, so kind of very interesting topic. You know, there's the use of uh, paclitaxel. You know that maybe the you know those drugs that we're more familiar with in the coronary realm and now they're part of almost where the mainstay for kind of peripheral balloons where you, you know you're you're delivering this this drug through the intima and you know hoping it's lipophilic it's going to remain there it's you know it, as, as opposed to putting a stent in there so you're avoiding the restenosis rates that you might see um but just um I think recently, maybe you can help us clarify, there was a kind of a, a I think there was a meta-analysis that raised some, raised some concerns about the paclitaxel coated balloons and, and in particular with the femoral popliteal lesions. Um, maybe you can help us clarify a little bit. Yeah, you're probably referring to the uh, uh, study meta-analysis of uh, Constanzo's uh, that was published a couple of years ago in the Journal of the American Heart Association and created a big controversy of um, the use of drug-coated balloons and stents uh, in the uh, femoral popliteal compartment. And the controversy came because the meta-analysis indicated that drug-coated technology increases mortality, something that we had never even considered. So the FDA put a moratorium at that time and, uh, and had uh, the industry provide all the, uh, the data that they had accrued for those studies. And it called for making patient level meta-analysis instead of, or as opposed to study level meta-analysis. Now, this is a study level meta-analysis that you cannot adjudicate causality. You can in a patient level meta-analysis, but not in a subject level meta-analysis. You cannot do Kaplan-Meier curves for survival, but it gave a, um, a link to adverse outcomes. And that was mortality, and that was very, very worrisome. In fact, there was a, a dose-death um, relationship. So that signal was very important, and it was a very well-done meta-analysis. It was a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. Since then, there's been a few patient-level meta-analysis, and the, the data has been all over the place. Uh, some of them have shown that there's no signal, but others have shown that there is a signal. So even though nobody knows what is the reason for this signal, the uh, FDA has uh, mandated that caution uh, be, uh, be placed on the, uh, on the labels of these uh, devices. And 
at least at Montefiore, what we've done is that we have changed the consent. We let our patients know that there's a question that's being uh, um, dealt with by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, but we don't have a concrete answer. And I think it's our responsibility to let them know that uh, there's, there's, there may be a problem, but we're not sure what it is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that was a, that's very good. I think, um, I think uh, overall for our audience, I think it's very important, um, you know, just recognizing the prevalence of the disease. You know, um, I, can, I think across all fields, we end up seeing patients who are hypertensive, are diabetic, or that are smokers, and kind of like how you highlighted in some of your uh, slides, so, you know, it's end up being very significant risk factors. Nearly a third of those patients end up having undiagnosed peripheral arterial disease, which kind of can in the long run contribute to a lot of uh, morbidity. So um, I think uh, kind of keeping an eye across all disciplines at this point ends up being very important. So uh, again, it, important that we spread the word to our colleagues, and whether they're in nephrology or endocrine, that uh, you know, this disease, disease does exist and it might be silent, but certainly it, it can declare itself. So it's, um, I think getting those ABIs, you know, uh, uh, ultrasounds and PVRs ends up being, being quite important. I, and I think uh, just kind of recognizing that it's a very, these are very important risk factors for a disease. Um, and certainly we're well equipped here to, to uh, kind of handle these uh, conditions. So, um, if you have a, a, any more questions, uh, let me take a quick look. No, I don't see any more questions. Well, okay. Well, then, thank you very much, Dr. Wiley. It's uh, again, it was a pleasure. I think uh, we all learned a lot. I think it's important to. Uh, I think the take home is that the peripheral vascular disease is out there, and it's uh, it's it's prevalent, and it's it, it, patient that may not be complaining, but it, it's important to um, you know just keep your eye on eye on it out there because it does exist. And, and we're certainly here to help. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Wiley. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, uh, thank you everybody, for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you.